So the big idea that I wanted to sort of pitch is that there's only one Pentecost. And that this Pentecost happens at one point in like an eternal moment. And Noah and Abraham and Moses and the apostles all participate in that day of Pentecost. But so did the people at the Tower of Babel. Yeah. So did the people at the Tower of Babel. And that if you participated it correctly, then it will unify and also multiply. And if you don't give it your focus, if you don't give it your attention correctly, then you're going to be divided and you're going to be scattered. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to The Symbolic World. So hello, everyone. I am back with Richard Rowland for Universal History. This is the first episode we're recording after the Symbolic World Summit, if I remember That's correctly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so um, what we want to do is go back into the Tower of Babel story, because Richard has some amazing reveals about that story and how it connects, you know, to the to the Old Testament. Uh, I mean, how it connects to Pentecost in crazy ways that, that, that yeah, just blew me away when I found them out. So I... So I think that we definitely need to go back into that. So Richard, take us take us away. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of give away the farm now. There were some things that I was teasing a little bit in the last Tower of Babel video that we did. And I said, you've got to come to the summit to get the rest of it. And of course, lots of people couldn't come to the summit. So the good news is I'm going to I'm going to basically kind of give you guys what you know, what was missing, because actually at the summit, I still couldn't say everything that I wanted to say because <laughs> Because uh, it just wasn't time and I was trying to be respectful of the other speakers and, and not take their time. Because that's like the unforgivable sin as a presenter is, is going over your time. So um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. There will be like a little bit of repeat because what I want to do is to um, uh, just just frame things up a little bit. So there'll be a little bit of a repeat here, but um, we can uh, we can go. Uh, uh, but that'll that'll be all right. So. We talked last time about the Book of Jubilees, um, and the Book of Jubilees is really important to the Christian tradition, actually. It doesn't matter if the Book of Jubilees is not in your Bible. It doesn't even matter if, um, at some point, the reading of the Book of Jubilees was maybe banned in your church sometime a long time ago. There are a lot of things. Well, that did. I don't think that happened with Jubilees. I know it happened with Enoch in the yeah. in the West, but... Um, but the Book of Jubilees just has a lot of information that you probably take for granted uh, uh, as a Christian. That's, But it's actually stuff that's not explicitly in the scriptures. Um, if you've ever had the idea that the devil and other demonic spirits are fallen angels, um, the idea that the sons of God mentioned in Genesis are fallen angels, or the idea that the sons of God mentioned in Genesis are descendants of Seth, actually both of those ideas come from this whole body of, of literature that includes Jubilees. Um, even the idea that righteous people go to a place called heaven or paradise and wicked people go to a place called hell and that there are rewards and punishments that are proportional to your righteousness or your wickedness. These are things that are not explicitly in the Old Testament. They're spelled not out in the Old Testament. Testament. Right. Unless you have third Esdras in your Old Testament, which some of us do, in which case then you're, you're gold. But anyway, um, yeah, so uh, so some of us, I love when you say some of us, like who is the us that has third it's just the Russian Orthodox Church? Really? Like I didn't yeah, know even know yeah, that. that yeah, the Russian Orthodox if, Church has if you're in that sort of like Slavic Russian Orthodox tradition, then you can make the case that third Esdras is actually in your Old Testament. So, well, luckily um, we are. So we're we good. are. That's right. Um, third Esdras, by and the that, way, that one is of, getting us ready for Dante, by the way. We that is. To... Yeah. Third Esdras, as I mentioned in yesterday in the retrospective that we did for the summit, somebody asked a really fun question about Apocrypha in the retrospective. And I said, you know, my favorite apocryphal book, although actually it's in my Old Testament, is Third Esdras. And um, uh, it's uh, it's actually one of the important foundational texts for understanding the Divine Comedy, which I think is something most people don't know. So if you like this sort of thing, uh, we'll be doing. We'll be starting our first class on the Divine Comedy. It'll be five weeks. Uh, it'll be just on the Inferno, and then we'll come back in a few months and do uh, Purgatorio and then Paradiso. And uh, it's starting Orthodox Bright Week. So that's the week of. I'm just going to go ahead and tell people. 
because uh, I think you'll be able to order the class soon. It's going to be uh, the week of the 5th, so that'll be Thursday the 9th, May the 9th. Thursday, May the 9th is when our first class will be. So anyway, um, okay, so all of these things that people assume to be true about the scriptures and how we read the scriptures come from Jubilees and from these other works generally referred to as the Apocrypha. And um, uh, so uh, with that with that kind of being said, I want to look at specifically the idea of feasting and sacrifice in the Book of Ju Jubilees real quick. So one of the main themes of the Book of Jubilees is the idea that the Old Testament liturgical calendar, that is the feasts of the law, uh, uh, are um, ontological realities that... Uh, the, the way the Book of Jubilees uh, puts it is that these feasts have been celebrated in heaven since the creation of the world. So, uh, and this includes things like the observance of the Sabbath and then also the great feast of the Mosaic Covenant. Now, obviously, you can see the establishment of the Sabbath in the Genesis story, yeah. right? Uh, but Jubilees sort of takes this idea farther. So Jubilees is kind of what you could call like a midrash or like a commentary, really like an expansion of Genesis. Sometimes it's called like lesser Genesis for that reason. Um, and uh, so it takes this idea a little bit further and it says that along with the observance of the Sabbath, that the great feast of the Mosaic Covenant, uh, which which importantly, uh, 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 Genesis predates the giving of the Mosaic Covenant, right? So the great feast of the Mosaic Covenant actually predate the covenant. Now, what's the implication of that, by the way, for Christians? Well, is that you keep celebrating these feasts. Like even if you're not part of the Mosaic Covenant, you would keep celebrating these feasts. More on that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they're ontological realities is because they basically they basically like reflect, how do I say this? You could say that these feasts reflect certain heaven real, heavenly realities that are kind of baked into the world at its creation. So participating in these days of rest and feasting like the Sabbath, the Day of Atonement, First Fruits, tabernacles the hidden significance of the eighth day and of course Pascha or passover which is the last those are the feasts that are introduced in jubilees um wait so it, you in jubilees is already an introduction of the eighth day idea because i know yep. it's in rabbinical text people have yep. told me that that in rabbinical commentary there are places where it says when the messiah comes we will no longer celebrate on the sixth day but on the seventh day yeah. and i was like what that's wild this is in uh this this happens in Jacob's visions that he has uh around the birth of Benjamin and the death of Rachel in, in Jubilees. Yeah. Yeah. So this is that's that 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 is in there. Wow. That's that is wild. in there. Yeah. So all of this stuff is kind of there in Jubilees. And as as we're gonna talk about in a minute, this becomes very important for the formation of the Christian liturgical year. Yeah. So the idea is that by participating in these things, it's a way to join human life and activity that is bounded by time to eternal realities, right? So that, you know, you could say, uh, somebody might say so that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Um, someone might say. Someone might say that. So much uh, much of this reflects, uh, and the, the the community community that wrote the Book of Jubilees or that at least copied and, and preserved it was a, was a community that's very concerned with calendars, the festal cycle, all these different kinds of things. Father Stephen DeYoung has a great book on the Apocrypha. It's just called Apocrypha. And it, he's got, you know, if you want to get the historical background, who wrote these things and who preserved them. By the way, all, almost all these texts were preserved uh, almost exclusively in Christian monasteries. So um, that's that's how we still have them. So other than the Sabbath, uh, the, first fruit to, uh, the first feast to be instituted in Jubilees is the Feast of the First Fruits. And this is known variously in the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition as Shavuot, which is the Feast of Weeks. It's also called the Festival of Reaping and also simply called Pentecost, although it's not usually called Pentecost in Jubilees because Pentecost refers to the fact that it's the 50th day after Pascha or Passover, which hasn't actually been instituted yet. Like humanity is given pa uh, Pentecost before they're given Passover in the mm -hmm. in the narrative in Jubilees. So, um, but yeah, but, but I'll probably call it Pentecost most, mostly, or the Feast of the First Fruits. Yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised to find that uh, this feast has a certain primacy of place in Jubilees. And this is because the law is given to Moses on the Feast of the First Fruits. So when Moses goes up the mountain and he, he receives the law from God, that is happening on Pentecost. And so the thing that Pentecost is you could say, is primarily a 
it is a celebration of the giving of the law of God, which is actually a revelation of who God is, and then the making of a covenant between God and man, or the making or the renewal of a covenant between God and man. Mm -hmm. So that's what Pentecost is. That's the, we'll talk about maybe the shape of, of more of the shape of the feast in a minute, but that's the event. So Jubilees has a frame narrative and the frame narrative is that the angel of the presence, who is Jesus, by the way, um, we know this because Jesus quotes himself in uh, Jubilees in the, in the gospel, according to St. Matthew. Um, and by the way, Jesus and various apostles quote and reference, even St. Stephen in his, in his, uh, his sermon before they stoned him to death, right? St. St. Stephen, the proto-martyr. He he makes several references to things in Genesis that aren't in Genesis, but they're mm -hmm. in Jubilees. Wow! So he's either quoting from Jubilees or he's quoting from some sim, some, yeah, some similar like the, a, a related tradition, right? Yeah. So um, the frame narrative is that the angel of the presence is giving the law to Moses, which is an event that happens on Pentecost, and so therefore Pentecost is the most important feast throughout the Book of Jubilees. It's even more important than Pascha, uh, which isn't actually introduced until the very end. Mm -hmm. So, um, what we're told is that uh, the very first Pentecost, the very first feast of first fruits, happens in the aftermath of the Great Flood, when Noah offers up his offering to the Lord. Now, as you would expect, if you know the story in Genesis, Noah's offering pleases the Lord, and God makes a covenant with Noah. And the covenant is not to destroy the earth again. But uh, one of the things that people forget, or not with a flood anyway, one of the things that people forget, though, is that God also, when he made the covenant, he also gave certain laws. Yeah, that's true. Um, Noah usually yeah. called like the Noahide laws. Yeah. Um, don't eat the... Uh, uh, Meat don't with, eat. That, with, with blood. Yeah. Yes. And actually certain laws that don't affect, certain laws that affect animals, by the way. One of the things that happens is God puts the fear of mankind into animals. That's why animals run away from you usually when you're in the forest, right? Uh -huh. Um, and things like that, like so. There, so, so there's a uh, there's a change in the state of what creation is, right? That happens at the giving of this law and of this covenant. Yeah, and so, many people, like by the way, even today, Jews understand that that law, in some ways, precedes the law of Moses because right. it is the standard by which all of humans are judged. And so, all the non-Jews are not judged by Moses's law, but are judged by Noah's law. That's right. And uh, you still have this understanding in, for instance, the very first church council, the first council of Jerusalem in the book of Acts. That's what they said. Basically, they take the, the Noahide laws and they apply those to Gentile converts. Mm -hmm. So they say, for Gentiles coming into the church, you have to live by these laws, but you don't have to keep the Torah. Did they right? explicitly, I forget, did they explicitly say which laws those are? And they're exactly the laws that are... Yes, yes, yeah. Wow. It's don't eat things strangled, abstain from fornication, all that stuff. Because basically all of that stuff goes along with idolatry. That's kind of the subtext there. Is that is that even fornication in the ancient world, like there were just random prostitutes in, in towns in the ancient world, of course, but most prostitution in the ancient world is uh uh is connected to the cults of certain deities mm -hmm. right so even even fornication and things like this i mean even if you're like uh committing adultery or something you would still say that there's like a god involved in that it's like eros or something so mm -hmm. um so the the things that were sp specifically supposed to abstain from um as they understood it in the book of acts are things that have to do with idolatry and that's also a tradition that comes from jubilee so i'll just uh Kind of go over the the account of the giving of the the Noahide laws as as it is in the Book of Jubilees. We're told that humanity can eat all animals, which the implication, by the way, is that's not something they were doing before. Yeah. Um, but that they can never eat meat with the blood in it, so nothing strangled. And in Jubilees, this is connected to specific instructions about worship and sacrifice. Mankind should offer worship to God and seek His forgiveness each morning and evening. So this is the establishment of the cycle of the morning and evening offerings, the morning and evening sacrifice, which is something that we still basically maintain in the church with the services of matins and vespers. Mm -hmm. um, and then also that mankind should keep the festival of the first fruits each year. So this is this is the third thing. And now we'll note something that's been sort of added to what you find in Genesis. Uh, so it says, and he gave to Noah and his sons a sign that there should not again be a flood on the earth. He set his bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant that there should be uh, by the way bow means like literally his weapon that's what a rainbow is i super hate all the people who are like it's actually a circle and that's to make you think of a wedding ring and and 
like I, this is this is a common explanation for the rainbow it's like well nobody knew what that meant until we got in airplanes and then we flew above the world and we saw that from from the air rainbows are circles and therefore it's a wedding ring and that's why the wedding ring is the sign of a coven and like whatever this is a thing you hear at protestant weddings oh, okay, sometimes by that. the way anyway super annoys me it's his bow because it's his bow it's his weapon it's the weapon with which he destroyed the world right that's that's what a bow is anyway um this is very common, like ancient Eastern Semitic language. So he set his bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant that there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it all the days of the earth. For this reason, it is ordained and written on the heavenly tables. So that this idea of the heavenly tables is a uh, is language that Jubilees comes back to again and again. And it's the idea that there's a heavenly Torah or there's a heavenly law. Um, and that's what everything is referencing back to. And that's basically you could say that's the thing by which the world consists is by that by by the heavenly law and the earthly law like the the torah that's given to moses is is like the earthly manifestation or representation of that but the real one is is this divine law so it's ordained and written on the heavenly tables that they should celebrate the feast of weeks in this month once a year to renew the covenant every year and this whole festival was celebrated in heaven from the day of creation until the days of, of noah 26 jubilees and five weeks of the year and noah and his sons observed it for seven jubilees and one week of years until the day of noah's death and from the day of noah's death his sons did away with it until the days of abraham this is an important detail and they ate blood hmm. and as we're going to see here in a minute eating blood is connected to uh, idol worship um, but Abraham observed it and Isaac and Jacob and his children observed it up to thy days that is Moses's days and in thy days the children of Israel forgot it until you celebrated anew on this mountain so remember that the context here is the giving of the law at Sinai yeah and do thou command the children of Israel to observe this festival in all the generations for a commandment unto them one day in the year is the in this month they shall celebrate the festival for it is the feast of weeks and the feast of first fruits this feast is twofold and of a double nature according to what is written and engraven concerning uh concerning it celebrate it so these laws are written or engraven upon the heavenly tables of the law and by keeping them what god promises he goes on to promise noah is that if you keep these laws so don't eat things strangled which is related to idolatry Worship God twice a day, morning and evening, and keep the festival of Pentecost every year. If you do these things, then God promises that humanity will continue to cohere, that they will be safe from the ravages of chaos as exemplified by the flood. Mm -hmm. And there's a really interesting uh, reference here, by the way, to the double nature of the feast. Yeah. What is that? What are they referring to? Not everybody agrees on this. Um, it might refer to the two occasions of the giving of the law and the covenants right after passing through the flood and then after passing through the Red Sea. But it might also refer to the fact that it has a heavenly and an earthly nature that the uh, say that every ancient agricultural society has a feast of first fruits. Yeah, right? that's just something that everybody has. Um, but it's like a joining of that part of the earthly cycle to a heavenly reality. And by the way, this is not a problem. Whenever somebody like looks at a Christian feast or a Jewish feast and they're like, oh, this is just a leftover from some fertility religion or whatever, like God made the world and the cycle of the seasons is is what it is. Like yeah. it's it's not it's it's so silly to think that that uh that the relationship between the natural cycle and heavenly realities should be arbitrary in fact no christian has ever really thought that and when i say this i mean like we have had arguments and even even schisms over calendars and i know that the calendar thing is something that sometimes people are like oh that's just stupid whatever and i'm not trying to start a calendar argument so that nobody nobody come at me you know um i'm on whatever calendar my bishop is on but yeah there you go the idea that a calendar doesn't matter that it's arbitrary and not really important it's not really a christian idea yeah so, anyway all right, so um, so, so the yeah. Uh, my ahead. question is too, like the double aspect of the of the feast. You know, one of the things I'm seeing with these with the notion of Pentecost is that it seems to be a feast that is that is about the manner in which heaven and earth touch each other, right? And so, yes, like this, that's this, exactly this, what it's about. And so, when heaven and earth touch each other, then you and it makes sense with the idea also of first fruit, which is the idea that you see. If you think about it in terms of agriculture as well, right? So you see the effect of the seed, the first effect of the seed that has come from heaven in the world. And that would be the 
equivalent of the law because the law is the is a fruit it's not it's a fruit of the connection of heaven and earth it's not the actual connection it's like the it's like the fruit of that and so you can imagine the same with all the the laws or all the manifestations of that covenant uh, and so in that sense already you can kind of see that sometimes you know some you know when jesus talks about how you know you the wheats and the tares grow together yes right that there's that there is also an aspect of the fruits or the first fruits that can be uh, maybe negative anyways all right continue on and we'll see no that's good that's good that you, you yes so uh the angel of the presence then goes on to give us certain details and jubilees about the history of the feast after noah noah kept it and also the related laws of daily worship not eating meat with the blood in it etc and it's forgotten after his death and this leads to the scattering of the nations at babel abraham came Abraham is then the first person to start keeping it again, and also his sons Isaac and Jacob keep it. And this is all in Jubilees. We get actually accounts of when did Abraham keep Pentecost, for instance. We'll, we'll come to that in a second. Um, but their descendants also forget it, and that leads to their captivity in Jacob. Right? So if you don't keep the feast, then you're scattered or you go into captivity. Mm -hmm. And structurally, this will set up uh, for uh, set us up for the next episode in, in the Genesis material that we find in Jubilees, and that's the Tower of Babel. So in between the account of the aftermath of the flood and that of the Tower of Babel in Jubilees, we get several important details, which really help kind of fill in the gaps of Genesis, which is the whole, again, this is the whole point of Jubilees, and, and, and help us understand the Tower's significance. So first, we get the account of Noah's drunkenness, uh, which is also there in, um, which is also there in Genesis, obviously. Now, the account of Noah's drunkenness is very important to the pattern of the Feast of Pentecost. Um, I'll talk about this maybe more in a minute, but but every time that Pentecost is celebrated in the scriptures, you'll have somebody receives the law from God and they come down to the people and then there's some strange episode of drunkenness that happens. Mm -hmm. um, for Noah, it's it's he gets drunk, right? And then his son takes advantage in whatever whatever that means whatever some, way we want to understand well that. well there's 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 a couple of things that it means um it i think there's a strong case father Stephen young has written about this um but i noticed the same thing too like there's a strong case to mean that it, it uh there's a the strong case to be made that it means that he had incestuous relations with his mother while noah was drunk um yeah. because that's what if you look at the phrase uncovering your father's nakedness yeah every else in the old testament that's what it means that's what it means um and then that makes that that makes canaan then this you know, like the, a product of incest, which explains why the the curse comes on him instead of on him. Anyway, anyway, yeah, um, we talk. We have a video about that with Father Stephen. So yes, I know, I know, I know, I know. So yeah, I just yeah, people go back and watch that if if, if you want to. But um, uh, yeah, pleasant stuff. So uh, but but another example, another example is of course the apostles, right? When the apostles are at Pentecost, um, they're uh. Well, actually, we'll talk about the apostles in a second. But another easy example is when Moses comes down, you know, at, at Pentecost, right? He's received the law. He comes down the mountain and There's the people, the people are, you know, engaging in like a, a giant drunken orgy, right? So there's this weird thing of like drunkenness happening at the end of Pentecost, which I think is, which I think is interesting. Um, uh, so we, we have that and the curse of Ham. And then right after that, we have Noah's sons divide the earth among themselves by lots. And this basically uh, foreshadows the table of nations in Genesis, which is, as we've talked about many times, is a vital passage to understanding the whole idea of medieval universal history. So after this happens, Noah makes a kind of a final testament in which he restates the Noahide laws and then shares his fears for what is going to happen to his sons and their sons after his death, you know, as far as they're going to stop keeping the laws and that all of these things are going to happen. Of course, that's what happens. Yeah. And then what we're told is that unclean spirits, so demons and the offspring of demons led by a mastema, who is also Satan or the devil, like he's got kind of different names throughout Jubilees, but they're used interchangeably. Uh, they torment humanity and they start to lead humans astray after the flood. And so this, this sets up another very important idea in the New Testament is that on the prayers of Noah, these demons are imprisoned in the underworld, all of them except for one-tenth who are allowed to continue to roam the earth and test mankind. This is an idea which St. Peter will refer to when he talks about uh, talks about the ones chained in Tartarus, right? This is the one, uh, this is like the whole idea when, um, 
when uh you know jesus uh, you know comes to the demons that are inhabiting yeah. you know the, the come to torment us before our time yeah that the time is the end of is the day of the lord right which yeah. they think is the end of the world but the day of the lord is actually that's when god comes to you right so um so it is, I, I mean that's the subtext there is it actually is their time but um <laughs> yeah so anyway uh all of this once again see father stephen de young's published works but uh, so they're allowed to continue to roam the earth and test mankind and, uh, including by afflicting them with like various diseases. And so, uh, we are told that Noah is then given a series of books and he's actually given them according to a related tradition. He's given them by the archangel Raphael, who's the sort of the patron angel of like healing that he's, he's given a series of books with the knowledge of the medicines and seductions of the demons and how to combat them. Interestingly with herbs from the earth, this mm. is such an interesting idea to me because it's like you can already see the idea of um uh the garments of skin or or like the the old word for this is pharmacon right the thing yeah. that like it's death but also you can use it to 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 ward off death right that's what was where we get our word pharmaceutical from um it's also interesting to think that in some ways it's it's the redemption of the you know of the of the book of enoch story Mm -hmm. Because in some ways, those things were revealed to humans by the demons. And so the Archangel Gabriel has to, in some ways, reveal them with their solution. You know, and so it's like it's the it's this completion of the pattern of how a civilization and, and the, this is also makes sense because that's what Noah is. And that's what that's who Noah is. Noah yeah. is the one who takes techne, who takes these revelations from. This, the, the sons of God that became civilization, became technology and weapons, and he makes the ark out of it. You know, and that's why Noah is often said to be married to Tubal Cain's sister, right. because he integrates, he's able to use this aspect of the world, kind of turn it. And so the idea that in Jubilees that um, Gabriel would reveal Ra Raphael, and, but yes. I'm sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, that Raphael would reveal this again to Noah, you know, the more pharmacon aspect of it, which was part of the Ethi the uh, the Enoch tradition. It makes a lot of sense. Well, and and the fun thing is that Raphael does this again in Tobit, right? So, so the book of Tobit, which is uh, actually is in your Old Testament for the majority of Christians that that have lived. Um, you won't have it if you're if you're a Protestant, then it'll be in Apocrypha. But but most most Christians at most times have had the book of Tobit in their Old Testament. And uh, Pat patristic commentaries on Tobit, by the way, are awesome. Very, very fun. Um, uh uh, the venerable B, an Anglo-Saxon, uh, Anglo-Saxon monk and 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 uh, you know writer, theologian, etc. He he has a wonderful commentary on Tobit. But anyway, in the book of Tobit, this is exactly what uh, this is exactly what um, the uh, the archangel Raphael does. Is he comes to he comes to uh, Tobit and and actually helps him helps him overcome the wiles of the demons by doing things that. Part of the reason that Luther didn't like Tobit is because he felt like it was too magical. Like yeah, there's too many like things, it. too many things that are like magic is like, oh, you're gonna go catch the certain fish and do the certain thing with it, and then you'll make some incense and the incense will drive the demon away and things like this. And and that really like, you know, when they're trying to like purge all the superstition, you know, from the world or whatever, like Tobit has or to go. Whatever. But 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 um but this is uh this is this is kind of like I mean that's the thing that Raphael does. That's what Raphael does. Like he's a healer, but he's more than just a healer. He shows the basically shows the way that the demon works and then gives you a way to, to counteract to it. Counter so it. um yeah, so uh and then we're told that in the days of Peleg, the city uh the tower of Babel, or really the city of Babel, is built. And it's not simply a tower, it's a city and a tower. And Father Stephen de Young, I made a point about this at the summit. Father Stephen de Young got on to me. He was like, well, obviously there's a city around it. I will just continue to maintain that most people don't always, don't necessarily connect the uh, the tower with the city. Really? Like, well, when I was a kid, we knew there was some kind of connection between Babel and Babylon. Obviously, they're the same thing. But we knew there was some kind of connection between the two. But but I think that I was always told that the Tower of Babel was built first, and then later people came along to the ruins and they built the city of Babylon or or something oh. like this, something like this. But but the tower was always just like, like even go look at artistic depictions of it. Sometimes it's shown with, with a city, alone. but That's most true. of the time most it's the time just it like shown alone. alone, like just like a big tower standing out in a field or whatever. Which which makes no sense if you think about it for like three seconds, but. A surprising number of people, myself included, grew up with like that mental image. And yeah, so yeah. 
I think is worth mentioning. So, so we're told in Jubilees that it takes 43 years to build. We get its dimensions. These are details we don't get in Genesis, of course. Um, and we're told that it's, you know, again, not simply a tower. It's a city and a tower. The city is in a square or rectangle. Um, and so the, the idea of the city being a perfect square, so it's not a yeah. round wall, it's a perfect square. This, yeah. this is actually very important to understanding, you know, the apocalypse. That's right. Um, and the descent of the new Jerusalem, but, uh, and the Lord says, and in Genesis, the Lord says, now nothing will, uh, like nothing will be impossible for them or something like that. But the, in Jubilees, it's like a little clearer. It says, the Lord says, now nothing will escape them, mm -hmm. which I think communicates very well, the totalizing nature of the spirit of Babel. Right. And then he confuses the tongues. So yeah. after the confusion of the tongues, a great wind comes and casts the tower down and the mention of the wind which destroyed the tower references this very old Jewish tradition, which, by the way, is also found in the Sibylline Oracles and also in Josephus, and Josephus' account of the fall of the Tower of Babel. So this is something everybody in the ancient world believed about the Tower of Babel is that it had been destroyed by a great wind, although that's not a detail in Genesis. And this passage is bracketed by two passages concerning Mastema and the evil spirits, one of which I mentioned just a moment ago. And these passages make it very clear that the context in which we are meant to understand the building of the Tower of Babel is that of idolatry. So it says, the sons of Noah began to war on each other, to take captive and to slay each other, and to shed the blood of men on earth, and to eat blood, and to build strong cities and walls and towers. And individuals began to exalt themselves above the nation. Mm. Boy, that's not a fun thing to think about and and to found the beginnings of kingdoms and to go to war with people against people and nation against nation and city against city and all began to do evil and to acquire arms and to teach their sons war and they began to capture cities and to sail sell male and female slaves and ur the son of kisad built the city of ur of the chaldees and called its name after his own name and the name of his father and they made for themselves molten images and they worshiped each idol the molten image which they made for themselves and they began to make graven images and unclean simulacra, which is not, I don't want to know what they mean by that. And malignant spirits assisted and seduced them into committing transgression and uncleanness. And the prince Mastima exerted himself to do all of this. And he sent forth other spirits, those which were put under his hand to do all manner of wrong and sin and all manner of transgression to corrupt and destroy and to shed blood on the earth. And it goes on. It's a really bad time. So so basically, so now he's talking about the, the foundation of Ur. Yeah. So, so that so Ur is built after Babel falls. After Babel, okay. Yeah, right. but basically, the point of these two episodes before and after the Tower of Babel is to show that the idea of building a city in a tower is connected to the idea of of idolatry, right? That that's what it's for. So this general state of affairs continues until Abraham, and Abraham is pious and as the is the first man since the death of Noah to reject idolatry and to worship the one true God. This is what we're told in Jubilees. So as a result of his piety, um, by the way, there are other traditions that actually have Abraham like contemporary with Nimrod and like he's there at the fall of the Tower of Babel and um, that stuff is really fun. But anyway, um, that's not necessarily in Jubilees. The timeline's like a little foggy. Yeah. <clears throat> so as a result of his piety and uh, his efforts in defying the work of Mastema, destroying his father's idols, so on and so forth, God sends an angel to open Abraham's mouth and ears so that he can understand Hebrew. And Hebrew is the knowledge which has been forgotten since the fall of the Tower of Babel. Um, it actually says that, that the, 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 word, the language of Hebrew has been lost since the fall. So if you're reading that in like a post-Augustinian post context, you would be like, oh, since, since Abraham, uh, oh, or sorry, since like, Adam, since Adam and Eve, like since that tower. fall. But mm. it probably means the fall of the tower. Um, that's the most recent fall that's been been talked about, and that's where you know confused tongues are confused and everything else. And and uh, the the fall in Eden was not like <clears throat> before Augustine. It's not the defining fall for everybody. Yeah, certainly not for ancient Jews. There's various ones. So, um, uh, so he's given the the knowledge of Hebrew, and this allows him to read the books of his father Terah. Now, we don't know exactly know what these books are. They seem to have been passed down from Noah. Um, so maybe these are the books that Raphael gave him, but they recount the true history and the nature of the world up to that time. And it is from these books that Abraham learns the law of God. And all of this is many generations before the same law is going to be given again to Moses on Sinai. So all of this culminates in Jubilees chapter 15, when Abraham sacrifices at the Feast of the first fruits and offers a sacrifice to God. 
God accepts Abraham's sacrifice, and this is the occasion of the first giving of the Abrahamic covenant. So this is the next covenant that we meet in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows the story. Abraham cuts all the animals in half, and then like God comes between them like a smoking lamp and a burning furnace and all this stuff. But in Jubilees, that happens very explicitly at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So Noah celebrates Pentecost, and God makes a covenant with him. Abraham celebrates Pentecost, and God makes a covenant with him. And all of this is being told to us when Moses is celebrating Pentecost, and God is making a covenant with him. Is there is there in Abraham? Is there a case of drunkenness after that, or something? I was just wondering askew? that. I can oh something hold on. askew. There is something, and I can't remember what it is now. Um, hold on. Um, What's the story right after the right after the? Oh, so in in Jubilees, it is a uh, Sarah's laughter. Huh. That comes after the, mm -hmm. the Yeah. Um it and 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 I think this is sort of like to counteract the drunkenness, right? Uh it's the institution of circumcision. So that that's comes that right. So comes after, right after, after that. Okay, so right after the which first? The laughter first? Yeah, it's circumcision first. Oh, the other fun detail that you get in Jubilees, and this is something that I think Father Stephen DeYoung has talked about, is we're told right after the institution of circumcision that all of the nations have been given to have been given to demons to rule, uh, which itself is a kind of disorder. It says the laws for all the generations forever, and there's no circumcision of the days and no omission of one day out of the eight days. For it is an eternal ordinance ordained and written on the heavenly tables. Everyone that is born, the flesh of whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day, belongeth not to the children of the covenant, which the Lord made with Abraham, but to the children of destruction. And it goes on, it says... Uh, for the angels of the presence and all the angels of sanctification have been created from the day of their creation and before the angels of the presence and angels of sanctification, he hath sanctified Israel. So actually, Israel has been set apart even before the angels were made, so that they should be with him and with his holy angels. And do thou command the children of Israel and let them observe the signs of this covenant for the generation as an eternal ordinance, and they will not be rooted out of the land, for the command is ordained for a covenant. So this is still the giving of law. Um, and there's a... Um, by the way, it says, for Ishmael and his sons and the brothers of, and his brothers and Esau, the Lord did not cause to approach him, and he chose them not because they are the children of Abraham, because he knew them, and he chose Israel to be his people. Um, and then it goes on, and uh, yeah, we get Sarah's, we get the the announcement of, uh, the prediction of the birth of Isaac, and uh, Sarah's laughter, and the angelic visitation, like all of that stuff. Uh, and then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, it all comes right in that sequence which is the same sequence you get in genesis um i think think finding the drunkenness parallel here is maybe a little difficult yeah but, it might be difficult but no worry uh, about it. yeah I don't, i'll think about that a little bit more. we have to think about it we, symbolism we, happening laughter for sure the people. laughter is yeah is is a kind of counter reaction to the revelation yeah. right it's like this 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 un, yeah. this lack of control that's at the you know that's so in give give sarah a little wife. slack by the way people like you know that's uh what else would you do like I, I think that no, we often if, have to put ourselves in the position of these characters. Yeah. Like some of the the reactions, even that God will punish, are completely reasonable. Like the ark falling over and someone going to to like yeah. to stop it. It's yeah. like, what would you do? I would do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's like Sarah's uh, Sarah's laughter. Like is one of those things. Like it's not a ha ha that was funny laughter. It's a what else do you do but laugh? Like in the face of somebody of God telling you this when you're in your nineties. Like what else yeah. do you do? But anyway, okay. So we'll think about that a little bit more. I think that there probably is something there. I mean, like all the Sodom and Gomorrah stuff happens right after that. Yeah. So, maybe. so that's something that something I got to think about. Um, now, at this point, I have to confess to everybody that I buried the lead. So this is the big secret. I apologize for all the repeated material, but I wanted to set this up. So this is the big secret that we didn't share in the last video. Here, I must once again mention that the author of Jubilees is hyper attentive, like obsessively attentive to calendars. He always tells you the day or at least the week in which significant events are occurring. And if you pay very close attention, you will find that God descends to confuse the tongues and scatter the nations from Shinar in the fourth week, which is how Jubilees usually introduces the Feast of Pentecost. In other words, uh, for instance, Jubilees chapter 15. The context of Babel is thus a bad it it it's it's a celebration of Pentecost. That's what's happening at Babel. They're when, celebrating yeah, when the tower yeah. is destroyed. The, yeah, it is they're, a they're, celebration of Pentecost. They're celebrating Pentecost, but it is an act of false celebration of idolatrous worship. And the Lord descends. 
what happens at Pentecost? God descends, like earth meets heaven, right? So God descends as he did with Noah and with Abraham, but this time it's not to make a covenant or give God's law but it is rather to bring confusion and scattering, which is the promised consequence of idolatry. So Jubilees relates to us this tradition, which contrasts the worship and the giving of the covenant to two righteous men, Noah and Abraham, and actually later Isaac also celebrates the Jubilees, uh, Pentecost and Jubilees, to idolatry, and therefore confusion and, and dispersion uh, it contrasts the generation of Babel against the people like the people of God. And so these are, we could say, three different events in linear history. But remember that Pentecost has been celebrated in heaven since the world was created. This is what mm -hmm. we're told. Well, that means Pentecost is always being celebrated in heaven, right? Like it's always like it's a it's a it's a reality there um, that our experience of linear time is is connects to through the act of celebration, right? And this is this is a really important way. I mean. I, I the the symbolism of 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 feast and celebration, and I know it's heaven meeting earth, like you can just say that or what but like if you really think about like what is happening when you celebrate something, I feel like that's the whole like to me that's the whole enchilada. Like if you could just understand like what's going on with celebration, then you'd understand everything in the Bible and also everything about the world. Like yeah. it's I just like I get stuck on it so much because it's <sighs> celebration is the act of celebration is the way by which we connect to higher or lower realities right and it's it's really it's the way that you know you you gave this great keynote at the summit talking about how human uh, attention right through the the figure of the son of man right is the thing by which the world orders itself but celebration is the primary action uh that gives attention like that's yeah. the primary way you give something attention is by giving it a celebration so we need to really this is to me this this idea that pentecost in, and the idea of the first fruits and also the notion that this has to do <clears throat> with multiplication like that's actually what because you let's say we look at theophany for example like our celebration of theophany theophany is also a joining of heaven and earth right yeah. the, the spirit comes down on the waters the earth is gathered up together you know, there, there's definitely a relationship between the two, but the idea that that Pentecost would be related to the multi to multiplication, yeah, is makes a lot of sense. It also makes a lot of sense of this weird covenant that Abraham does. It's the weirdest thing in the world. How? Why in the world? Like I've never understood it. Why would you cut things in half? Like why are you cutting these bulls in half? And then you're walking through the middle. There's it's no good explanation for that outside of this, by the way. People will, again, like covenant theology is like a big deal in like reform circles that I came from. And people would always be like, yeah, the word covenant comes from the word cutting because you have to like kill something to make a covenant or, you know, so, something like this. But it's and like you have itself... to kill it and you have to split it in half. And then right. like and then walk, God reveals himself like listen, in weddings would be a dead, lot gorier dead if animal like did it this way. Yeah. But this makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense of it in the sense of, you know, first of all, this idea that God manifests himself amidst the cutting, like amidst the separation. Yeah. Right. It makes sense of the separation of the waters in the in Genesis one. But then it also makes sense of the idea that, you know, if you think about how creation works, there's two aspects of it. One is unity. One is unifying and one is separating. That's how the world works. In order for any identity to exist, two aspects have to, to be true. You have to separate it from other things and you have to unify it to itself. And so the idea, the idea of that is what the logos does, or that is what the influence of heaven does, is that it unifies and it separates. And, and what's interesting about the Pentecost image is that it seems to be God revealing himself in the separation. Yeah. Right. In the multiplication. Right. So it's like, right. think about it, its first fruit. So, you know, the seed comes down, all these fruits appear, and then God manifests itself in this multiplying. But if but if it's not celebrated, then it's just separation. Yeah. Right. So if it's not if it if it's not celebrated properly, then the influence of heaven becomes scattering. It's like it 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 will it it the scattering without the unifying. And you can think about it like everything makes sense. Like think about the judgment of God too. You know, that's what that, that's what happens when the, you know, the idea of, of the goats going away, scattering away, or the idea of the burning of the chaff, this idea that in some ways 
you know, when heaven and earth, when God manifests himself, that's what happens, unity and separation. But if it's not proper, then it, it then right. it ends up being, it, I mean, it and can that, end up being separating. That unity and diversity, those two things together is that's, that is the Trinity, that, right? Yeah. And, 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 and in this point, I think that I can say non-heretically, always like I'm nervous about speaking about the Trinity in public because you're going to do like an accidental heresy. Yeah. But that this is this is an essential aspect of of divinity. This is what God is, right? Is is these two things together, like unity, but really, really, it's a com community, like community, right? A communion of love, and that this is an essential thing to the way that God is. And and when He reveals that aspect of Himself, if you don't celebrate it, or you try to instead focus on yourself and celebrate yourself, um, there's there's this sort of self reflexivity to idolatry i think um and if you try to like sort of celebrate yourself or focus on yourself even that 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 chilling sentence people put the uh exalted the individual over the nation right that yeah. even that kind of an idea right um that's the, oh, then yeah by the way yes. richard i think okay so it's not sarah's laughter what is it it's Lot's drunkenness. It has to be. I'm Lot's so stupid. Of course it is. It has to be Lot's drunkenness and his incest with his daughters. Like that's it's it. right downstream from oh the covenant. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm very dumb. That is that's correct. That's that's right. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm yeah. dumb too because it's so ah. obvious. And you and it's like it's so obvious. I'm like just let it run, Jonathan. There just you go. Let it run. There you go. There you go. And at some point, it's like there oh, you of go. Of course. Oh, I mean, that's and and what does that lead to? That leads to the 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 even the the sort of the scattering of the of the seed because like Lot's a, a righteous man and he's part of. You know, but then it creates Moab and it creates Ammon, like these two, yeah, like the like long, Israel. long term ancestral enemies of Israel, right? It's create, yeah. Okay, that's there. We go. All Boom. right. So now we need. So we need to bring it. That's down. the second. Like, that's also like the second incest uh, connection with Pentecost too. Of if, if you take that one uh, uh, interpretation of what Ham did. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Super weird. All right. Um. Yeah. So to kind of like bring this down. So. The, the basic idea, I think we talked a lot in our last video, and we're kind of running through our time here, so I'm not going to restate all of this, but we talked a lot in our last video about uh, the account of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and paralleling it to these accounts of Pentecost in the Old Testament, actually to the Tower of Babel, which is something in the Orthodox Church. We literally have, um, you know, hymns of old, the tongues were confounded because of the audacity and the building of a tower, but now the tongues are made wise for the sake of the glory of divine knowledge, right? And so even, uh, by the way, like the way that all of this interacts with language is also something, uh, and the, the, the like connection and jubilees of like language and law and those two things together, like this is something I'm still trying to think about. But um, so, so I mentioned last time that there's this early tradition that you can still find recorded in the writings of many of like Oriental Orthodox communities, that the day of Pentecost is the occasion actually of the first divine liturgy. So in the Divine Liturgy, we mm. have a part called the Epiclesis, which is the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts. Uh, in the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, for instance, we say, send down your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these gifts here set forth, right? And and uh, and uh, so if you think about it, like what are the apostles gathered together to do? Well, they're all still basically pious Jews, right? Christ always kept Pentecost. Uh, we know this from the Gospels. So they're gathered together in the upper room to celebrate Pentecost together. So they're keeping this sort of ancient law that's written on the tables of heaven. And they're celebrating Pentecost together. And they call down the Holy Spirit. And what happens? This wind descends on them. Mm. And the wind uh, unifies, it multiplies, but it also scatters. Remember that there are people there who think the apostles are drunk. Yeah. Now, and this is a weird thing. Because if you pay very close attention, you will find that the apostles are not, for instance, is not a, a, an example of of glossolalia. They're they're not just like babbling, like you no. know, uh, like Pentecostals or something. Um, not trying to throw anybody any shade, but that's not what's happening in the Book of Acts. People hear um, in their own language. People hear them in their own language, but some people hear drunkenness. Yeah, and that is a weird thing. And but it it only makes sense if you kind of have this understanding because some people hear drunkenness. Why? Because they're not keeping the feast. Yeah. Right. They're not they don't have their attention oriented correctly. So what mm. they hear and they experience it as drunkenness and scattering, and they say, These guys are drunk. What are you what are you guys listening? Like they're just babbling, right? Mm. And uh and in that sense, it's like a funny, almost like kind of a funny pun on the whole Tower of Babel thing, right? That word that means confusion and has come in our in our language now to mean a, a particular kind of linguistic confusion. 
So the big idea that I wanted to sort of pitch is that there's only one Pentecost. And that this Pentecost happens at um, one point in like an eternal moment. And Noah and Abraham and Moses and the apostles all participate in that day of Pentecost. But so did the people at the Tower of Babel. Yeah. So did the people at the Tower of Babel. And that if you participated it correctly, then it will unify and also multiply. And if you don't give it your focus, if you don't give it your attention correctly, then you're going to be divided and you're going to be scattered. Mm. Um, so we've been making these universal history videos for about two, a little over two years now. I think we, you know, by my last count, probably had like 23 videos in the series. Maybe this will be number 24. They've been genuinely, uh, generally popular, very well received. I've gotten such an outpouring of of appreciation from people, which I'm very grateful for. But I do get some funny questions. And sometimes these funny questions are just people like missing the whole point of a video. And sometimes it's people like trying to educate me about their favorite forms of like heterodox esoterica. Like, have you tried, you know, tarot or have you tried... Um, uh, like psychedelics or whatever is like, no, 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 thank you. But one of the most common questions that I get from people like normal people is what do you mean by universal history where the emphasis is on the second word, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the word history, like in its early sense from Greek means like inquiry or, or knowledge gained from inquiry. And so we still preserve this in the sense of terms like the natural history museum and so forth. Uh, um, uh, by the time the word makes its way into Old English, uh, by Lat uh, via Latin, it's picked up sense of being the account, the description, the written account of past events, um, a story or a narrative. And by the 12th century, when it's being used in the Middle Ages, it means something like the account of events as relevant to a group of people or people in general. Mm -hmm. So the story of your people mattered because it was your story, because participation in that story makes you a part of your people. And if you forget yourself, you cut yourself off from reality. And this is what happens at the Tower of Babel, is that people forget Noah. They forget the laws that were given to Noah. They forget the covenant of God, but they're really forgetting themselves. They're forgetting mm -hmm. what it means to be human. And so taken in this sense, universal history is a history of everything and everyone. It's a history of who we are, how we got to be where we are and how the laws and the customs and the rituals and traditions of our people give us meaning and allow us to continue to cohere so that we can be long in the land. And every work of Jewish and Christian history from the first writings of the books of Moses until modern times has seen it necessary to begin at Genesis because Genesis has the answer to these questions. So the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a work which is mostly concerned with events in the 8th and 9th centuries in England, begins with the incarnation, but also takes pains to trace Alfred back to Noah. So later on, our 19th century German friends will try to move history closer to the sciences to make it a Wissenschaft. And uh, there was, uh, uh, as one of the uh, fathers of modern source-based uh, historiography put it, history should be concerned with what really happened. But that this is only knowable through what he called genuine and original documents. And so this attitude towards history, so what that meant was you couldn't actually uh, trust ancient historians. Like you have to ignore them and you have to go for like other things. And this attitude towards history is it's not unlike the obsession with like the idea of like the original articles in biblical textual criticism, which has has driven many people away from the faith, quite frankly, yeah. since, since we don't have any such articles. So this is how this all relates to Pentecost taken in the medieval sense. Jubilees is this work of history. This is why I'm so interested in it. We'll probably do more videos about it. Um, it's a work of universal history because it shows the way in which the basic patterns of religious life, which are feasting and fasting, Sabbaths and holy days, are the very shape of reality itself. That's the whole point of the book of Jubilees. And by conforming our lives to these patterns, we exist and cohere we remember ourselves and we host angels. Like if I could tell tell on myself a little bit, um, when I was a Protestant, there was like one year and I was on staff at the church. So I'm telling on myself. 
there was one year when uh, people just like, sort of forgot that Easter was next week. And so it, it was rolling around and we're like, oh, crap, Easter is next week. We didn't plan anything. And and somebody said, well, let's just push it out a month um, because there's no reason. We might have actually been on, on old calendar Easter that year. I don't know. But yeah, but they were like, well, let's just push it out, push it out a month. It doesn't really matter when we celebrate it. Right. If you live this way, your life and your society, your culture will be scattered and overtaken by a ro roiling chaos of competing principalities. Mm -hmm. Because all of these lower principalities are basically fighting over a vacant throne. And I think that we see that the, the, the account of Pentecost and Acts alone is enough to kind of convincingly show, for instance, the way that histories like Jubilees are seen by the ancient Jews, by the apostles, by the early church. Um, and there are a lot of other examples of that that I haven't mentioned. But um, when I first kind of conceived of this talk, I was just thinking, let's just do neat extra biblical traditions about Genesis. Like, and I'll just talk about that at the summit. But as I started digging into Jubilees more closely, and the more closely I looked at the traditions around the Tower of Babel, I realized that this is really a perfect case study for the mm. whole idea of universal history, right? This is why we're doing this project. It's my deep belief that the time of scripture is the time of our own lives, that we're not fundamentally different people from the human beings who first attempted to build Babylon the Great, right? So the question that I'm asked most frequently by listeners is how do you integrate all this universal history stuff into your daily life? Like, what should I do? Um, and um, uh, the suggestions that people sometimes come up with worry me a little. Sometimes uh, it seems like everybody's reflex is to like make up some own little rituals or practices to give their lives meaning. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say like, don't do that. That's what I want to just tell people is don't try to roll your own. Okay. Um, instead, start by doing what God commanded Noah. According to the book of Jubilees, every human being that has ever lived is commanded to pray each morning and evening together with your family or with other people if you can. If you need help figuring out what to pray, I have suggestions. Keep yourself clean from idolatry and keep the feast of Pentecost. And I mean, really keep it. Be present in church on the day of Pentecost. Participate in the sacrifice of the people of God. And of course, as St. Peter ends his, his great Pentecost sermon, repent and be baptized, right? That's how he ends it, um, actually. Like I, like I like how even St. Peter ends with go to church. So, um. Yeah, so that's and but he says he says that when he says repent and be baptized for the forgiveness forgiveness of sins, he says this promise is for you and for your children. Mm -hmm. And this idea of the promise being for you and for your children, even in there, there's this idea that thing we're doing in religion, in Christianity or really any other religion for that matter, isn't just like here's a nice individual choice that I am making mm -hmm. on behalf of myself. But rather I am joining myself and also the people who come after me to a community to a story right and therefore the promise and what's another word for promise well it's covenant right is for you and for your children and so peter is showing them the way here's how now if you want to participate in the covenant right god's law coming and being written as it was prophesied in the old testament not on tables of stone but on our hearts if you want to be a part of that you have to join that covenant and 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 come in you know come in as a family into the family so to speak so Anyway, that's uh, that's just a some of that's rehashing and uh, some of that stuff that I ran out of time to stay at the summit. So, um, but I think the big the big interesting reveal, at least for people interested in the the idea that Pentecost is the anti Babel, right? We hear yeah. that in church, and when you see the story in scripture, you you can see it, but it's very odd. It's kind of yeah. you get a sense of what it is, but then the best way to understand it is that. Pentecost is really the full revelation of that pattern because it has both, you know, the unifying and the multiplying, yeah. right? In extreme, in an extreme way, because the multiplying is, is an aspect of unifying, right? So as the people hear in their own tongue, as there's this celebration of diversity, right? In the right way, which is that the logos can manifest themselves all the way into your own culture, which is what we keep saying in terms of what universal history is, is that, yes. that all true cultures, all true stories can be connected to the universal one, right? To the story of the logos manifesting in the world without completely losing its quality, right? Because that's also what Christianity is. And so in the story of Pentecost, you really get in some ways the full revelation of what universal history is 
And, you know, this image of I mean, this the wind. Image, sorry? The wind. I mean, it's the wind. The same wind is the same wind. The wind that yeah. knocks over the tower is also the wind that fills the the holy that the apostle is the holy spirit like in both cases like i mean it's i'm amazing. sorry I, I i i interrupted you but just like the idea that of of like god manifesting as wind by the way is something that really bothers me like in a good way but like it's like well you know. know it's so funny because the the people people they they they're so hung up like they, as soon as so when you start to see it a good example, you know, if you, you know, during the liturgy, <clears throat> if there are several uh, priests in the altar, you, they'll take the, I forget what the name yeah. of the cloth is, right? And then yeah. they'll do this over the, it's called, over it's the, the, it's the chalice. The air. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I remember a priest once saying, oh, we have proof that maybe this is just to chase away the flies. And I'm like, really? To chase away the flies? Well, actually, maybe it is to chase away the flies. But, but that, that doesn't. That doesn't prevent it from being not at exactly all exactly what it is, which is the descent of wind onto the e thing. Like, even even the action of chasing away flies, by the way, is exactly. a deeply symbolic action. Like, yeah it's, yeah, it's exactly like this. You want the things that don't belong to scatter, yeah. and you want right. the wind to come and unify that which is there inside. It's soup. But and by the way, do you know why it's called the air? No. What do you mean? Uh, well, I'm trying to remember if if that the particular thing they're moving is the air. I think the air is actually the veil that you put over the the. Some priest out there will correct me on this. I think the air is actually the. You know what? I have a theory about this, but I'm going to stop talking okay, because so I think don't, I, yeah, don't step I've got step. words confused in my head, and I don't want to embarrass anybody. So, but but for sure, what you can see is that you know even in the story in the gospel when Jesus actually blows on the disciples, like he just just blows on them you know all of these things which which oh no it is us... the air it is the air okay what is the air it's the it's cloth. called the air aer aer yeah. that's what the cloth is called and it's but it's i mean the word means like air it means it means the atmosphere mm -hmm. and if you uh the there's that prothesis uh ritual like the the liturgy before the liturgy the yeah. little thing that the priest and the deacon do to get the gifts ready prepared and if you pay attention to the service, they're actually like, it's like, it's the, it's the recreation of the world, the Genesis, but it's also the crucifixion. And both of those things are happening. So the air is like, that's the, that's the atmosphere. That's it's the air descending. The, the, yeah. The dome, the dome yeah. of heaven that's placed. Yeah. Above. So anyway, I, that's always been super cool to me because like when St. Maximus, the confessor says something like, um, uh, you know, when Christ was on the cross, he was creating the world or like finishing the creation of the yeah. world. Right. Um, like you actually see that in the prothesis ritual itself. Like it's, it's like that's just baked in and i'm sure nobody did that on purpose so to speak like it's just like this is what we do but anyway um yeah so so but yeah the, the but the air like the the wind descending the air descending the spirit i mean that's what the word that's spirit what it means, is right yeah. it's air and we don't and we don't have to you know once you understand that these things are not separated that yeah. that the the use of the physical let's say manifestation of the deep pattern is not a superstition Right, it is the uniting of heaven and earth, and so of course, blowing on something is not sufficient. Like I could, if I blow on, and if I blow on the on a cup just out of in my yeah, home, right. it does not make it the Eucharist. But in the proper context, within the proper meaning structure, you know, in the proper hierarchy, then the this physical act becomes the vehicle for the higher pattern necessarily because that's actually how the world functions and uh, just two more instances of 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 like air and blowing right um so christ when he comes to the apostles when he appears to them after his resurrection says that he breathes on them mm. and says receive the holy spirit and of course yeah. like the fullness of that doesn't come till pentecost which is a weird thing by the way yeah no, i don't really understand it's, why but it's is. also to show that look folks the spirit that the disciples receive from heaven is already the spirit that makes the world exist. It's like there is a newness to it, but there's also a deep continuity. It's not like this thing that all of a sudden happens and no, this ever. Yeah. It is It is in some ways something both new, but also a repetition of something that has always been true. So I'm not, I don't want to, to, to say that, can I say this? I don't want to diminish the reception yeah. of the Holy Spirit after baptism, but it is activating something which is true about being human. So there's an important difference between something being new and something being novel. Like novel is like, oh, I've mm. never seen this before. Something being new is in the sense of like it it hasn't uh like hasn't decayed. 
right? You know, like so it's like you can have something that's 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 new in the sense of of its um like the we sing in like the Paschal Canon, come let us drink the new vintage, right? This mm -hmm. is the new vintage, this is the new wine, right? Um but it but it's not like Pasco or Passover wasn't around before, right? But this is the but this is the better vintage, right? You know. And um, it's not like Adam wasn't literally created that way. Like right, Adam exactly, was literally exactly. created by this Holy Spirit, the same spirit on Pentecost, the one you receive after baptism, going into Adam, and that's actually how humans are made. So, and that brings me to the other example, which is when we make a catechumen in the Orthodox Church, okay, the priest reads exorcism prayers. And by the way, those exorcism prayers kick all kinds of butt. They're so cool. Um, he reads exorcism prayers, and he comes over to the catechumen, and we'll actually do this even if it's a baby um, uh, or an adult or whatever, will come over and he'll breathe three times in the face, over the face and breast of the of the person who's being received in the shape of a cross. And that breathing is especially with co connection to baptism, right? There is a sense of like God breathing a spirit into Adam, yeah. right? But it's also, it's also like a scattering, right? Because it comes with the exorcism, mm. right? It comes with the exorcism. The whole point of that breath, blows the sorry, demons out. <laughs> it does like i don't like there's there there's there's probably like a, a more intellectual way to explain this but yeah like you're just like it's a it's a it's a wind that scatters the demons right it blows mm. the demons out like and and um and there's something about the in the context of the rite that's being performed in the context of the person who's doing who is a priest who's who's you know been ordained for the purpose etc like but but it's it's just um i mean that is to me, that's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite rites because it's so earthy, and and you get to spit on the devil. And I know that some people are like, "Oh, the spitting on the devil thing that probably came later," and 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 whatever. Like, I don't care. I like it. Uh, but anyway, um, the 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 like, there's no way to like explain this stuff to to like a modern person without them like feeling like it's superstitious. But more and more, I think people are are coming back around to being able to understand the world in this way, and it's. It's it's the like for for a child or for a saint, it's very easy to understand what's he doing. He's blowing the demons away. Right. Yeah. And then if you ask a stupid person like me, then you, what's he doing? Oh, well, it's like the bread and, and you know, like it's you have uh, to I can explain the symbolism and stuff like this. Like I have to I have to like couch in all these things. But then like basically, you know, it's but it's both of those things. It's the way it's the way that the wind works. Right. Um a uh, great name for like a 70s like i don't know like celtic band anyway the the way that the wind works it's the it's the it's the way that the wind works in terms of uh it gives life but then it also blows things away that shouldn't be there so yeah going back again to like keeping the flies off the gifts or whatever which is you know this is one of the purposes of like the liturgical fans as well right yeah. well that has nothing that that does not in any way negate like the symbolism of what's happening on a spiritual level like that's the whole point. Yeah. yeah exactly. if somebody's like, this was to get rid of the flies. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I know. But like, you know, <laughs> there's li literally a demon called Lord of the Flies. So, you know, you do what you want to with that. But anyway, um, so I'm rambling now. But no, uh, but this is good. So I think I think that, you know, it, yeah, what I, the, the point I wanted to make before we end is mostly to understand how this is what universal history is. Yeah. Universal it is about this idea, the Pentecost as being the possibility of both multiplicity and unity fully, you know, uh, that everybody hearing the word in their own story, in their own logos, uh, in their own, uh, the logos hearing the logos in their own, their own lives and in their own traditions, all of this is possible. It doesn't mean that everything is good and that everything is right. kept and it's all good. And that's not what it means, but it means that that possibility is there and that the connection between the two will reveal what is true and what is good about about the story so yeah yeah all right it, everyone. it's beautiful it's beautiful like that and that's why like when i started looking i was like this is what it, this is what we have to talk about because it's the whole project it's the whole thing that we've been trying to do like all contained in a single story and i would just tell people listen you're gonna celebrate pentecost actually whether or not you want to and and the the the, the society that you live in is trying to build babel Right. And we see you can see what's happening. You can see yeah. the scattering coming. Right. So, you know, celebrate Pentecost. Be like Noah, be like, you know, and then, yeah, anyway, that's it.
All right, everyone. And so, uh, so yeah, this is, we're continuing on with the universal history. Pay attention. We, you know, we're coming back. So we'll see you very soon. And everyone pay attention because as we hinted at earlier, Richard and I are going to go to hell very soon. Actually, we're going to go to hell right. after Pascha, which is a bit odd. Yeah. We well, are... Lent was really busy, too busy going to hell in other ways. So. In other ways, exactly. <laughs> and so, and so we are going to do a first pass at Dante. We're going to go to, uh, to, to do the Inferno you know, we're going to do the contos, go through the contos. We're going to give ourselves a lot of time now for each episode to to listen to Richard's analysis. But then also I'll do some symbolic interpretation as well with questions. This is going to be a massive symbolic yeah. world feast. Um, and so we're definitely looking forward to going to hell with all of you uh, after Pascha. My favorite thing about Dante is that it, by the time you get through the comedy, you will have talked about everything. It is... It is in many ways the sort of the apex of the whole universal history project of the Middle Ages because Dante leaves almost nothing on the table. He integrates something from everything that came before him. Yeah. And uh, so it's going to be incredible. Um, I love the comedy, as most people know. I've taught through it several times. So I'm really looking forward to doing this with the Symbolic World community. So that's coming out May the... Sorry, did we already say the date? May the 9th. So it's, that's coming out May the 9th. And uh, you should be able to sign up for the class on Symbolic World soon. But I think there's already like a, a place yeah, where so you, you can go. Yeah, so you can go to symbolicworld.com and you will find a a place where you can sign up so you get the news as soon as we open the class. And so there's already quite a few people in there. So we're excited to see how it comes. So everybody, yep. talk to you soon. Bye-bye.